right, we're going to move to the second half of the Biographia Literaria. And uh, this is where he's no longer looking at the development of his own mind uh, in the formation of his poetic project, but is now actually dealing with uh, the going forward with the discussion of the project of poetry that led to the falling out between Wordsworth and Coleridge over the definition of the imagination. Um, and it just occurred to me, because this morning I was talking about this as well, Augustine's Confessions, where he give, writes a spiritual autobiography and talks about the development of himself, and to get to the point where he goes from being this worldling, a teacher of rhetoric, etc., to the path that led to his conversion and his uh, walk with God and the questions that rise out of it. Here we have in the Biographia Literaria a sort of spiritual autobiography, but it's more a poetic biography. And I'm not sure that it um, how it fits with a biography in general, because it's a literary biography. It's a biography of how he came to be the writer that he is, but it, it, it it excludes from that his uh, relationship to God, which is maybe that's not uh, even worth mentioning. I don't know. But uh, autobiographies are unusual. Biographies less so. Right? People writing about other people's lives, that happens often enough. An autobiography where you're writing about your own life is invariably pretty narcissistic unless you're writing about yourself in the light of what someone else has done to you, like Augustine. So here's my life, and here's what God did in my life. And so it's really about as much about what was done to me as opposed to what I did. But in Coleridge's conception, it isn't about all the things he did in his life. He's not talking about his childhood. He's not talking about any of those things. But he is talking about his intellectual development as a writer, for which he claims... I don't want to say credit, he doesn't consider them to be anything other than the, the thoughts that he had along his journey. So in this sense, he's very much in the mold of the Cartesian that I talked about this morning. He is the source of his own thoughts, or the cause of his own thoughts. And he makes various errors along the way, and uh, had reasons for them, and then he makes he develops along the way, and he, he does trace that from books 4 to 13, uh, where how he got to this, and then found this writer, and then it led to this, etc., until he finally has to interrupt himself with the letter from someone, and then he just blurts out the definition of the imagination, which we've been, all been waiting for, and then he moves on to the poems that were related to that definition of the imagination. And one of his critiques of the reason I'm mentioning this is his seems to me his one of his main critiques of Wordsworth is that it is insufficiently Christian in its conception. <laughs> and I, I say that because the definition itself spoke about the living power and prime agent of all human perception and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am, which we all said is clearly echoing the words of Exodus when God is, reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush and Moses asks who he is and he said, I am that I am. So that, that's what he's alluding to here, clearly. That passage, I don't see how else you, you could read that. The, inf the infinite I am, it's clearly a reference to God in his self-revelation. But he connects primary imagination to it, so to a human capacity to see, that, that's my take on it, because it's a little bit opaque. It's thinking God's thoughts after him. But part of it is the primary imagination relates to God himself. It's the living power and prime agent of all human perception, so it creates the world that we perceive, and then human beings see it. It's the repetition in the finite mind of that original eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. <clears throat>
So it's the, both of those things, it's two, even the primary is twofold. God creates it through his living power, and then we see it through our repetition. Our, and then once we've done that, only once we've do, done that, then we can secondarily echo that and, and alter it a little bit. We can tell stories that relate to the original story, but, but it's all predicated on the primacy of the primary imagination. And so it's not, not just first and second, there's a hierarchy there. So it, but that's a very, um, at least leaning in the direction of a theological reading of it. And that is at odds with the way Wordsworth sees it. That's why he's writing it. That's why he objects to what Wordsworth has said. I say that because now we come into the second half and he looks at the occasion of the lyrical bouts and he's going to give his, his own take on how these poems came about and wherein the conflict between him and, and Wordsworth arises. But it's interesting to note that his own understanding of his development isn't very Christian. It's just the, the concept. It's not attributing uh, much to God in the process. So I'll just, I'll just note that. So the occasion, this is just the, the beginning of the uh, chapter seems to have like a, a summary of the sub substance that'll be in the chapter. So it's somewhat helpful. So the occasion, the objects originally proposed, the preface, the ensuing controversy, its causes and acrimony, and then he gets to definitions. So, during the first year then, that Mr. Wordsworth and I were neighbors, our conversations turned frequently on the two cardinal points of poetry. One, the power of exciting the sympathy of the reader by a faithful adherence to the truth of nature. Now that sounds like mimesis to me. Right, but it's exciting the reader. It's delighting, in other words, exciting that, that so delighting by its truth, what it's teaching, and secondly, the power of giving the interest of novelty by the modifying colors of imagination, now he uses that word. So first is primary and then the secondary, those two things, I think he's just echoing what he's just identified. I'm not sure if I'm right, but it sounds to me like he is referring right back to that. The sudden charm, this is still the secondary, which accidents of light and shade, which moonlight or sunset diffused over a known and what familiar landscape appeared to present the practicability of combining both. These are the poetry of nature. Now again, nature, he must know, but he doesn't say much about this, is a complex word. And he hasn't disambiguated the complexity of it here, but, and it, it's the romantic view of nature here, which is a quasi-divine thing, which is an already an unusual in the in the whole history of the word nature. This is not this is a new thing itself, the the idea of nature in this sense. But these are the poetry of nature. The thought suggested itself to which of us I do not recollect that a series of poems might be composed of two sorts. In the one, the incidents and agents were to be, in part at least, supernatural, and the excellence aimed at was to consist in the interesting of the affections by the dramatic truth of such emotions as would naturally accompany such situations supposing them real. Note that the aim is to always engage the emotions, it's to engage the affections, it's to engage, it's not to present a realistic account. In the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, <coughs> which is his main contribution, the one best known at any rate, um, he's not so much interested in its correspondence with other truths. It's more in the truth of the emotions that are awoken in the process. Very much what we would call psychological. Emotion, naturally accompanying such situations, supposing them real. And real, in this sense, they have been to every human being who from whatever source of delusion has at any time believed himself under, the, under supernatural agency. For the second class, subjects were to be chosen from ordinary life. The characters and incidents were to be such as will be found in every village and 
its vicinity where there is a meditative and feeling mind to seek after them or to notice them when they present themselves. In this idea originated the plan of the lyrical ballads. And we know who's going to do what because he explains that Mr. Wordsworth, so he is supposed to um, do the first. His endeavors should be directed to persons and characters supernatural, or at least romantic. What does he mean by romantic here? They don't call themselves romantics, by the way. So this is one of the many things in the period that's challenging for uh, uh, others is where does this term romantics, why are these called the romantics? Because in English, the word romantic relates to the courtly love tradition largely, romantic love in the sense of love between a man and a woman, sort of that, that, that sort of interest. But that's not in these poems. Or where it is, like say in Christabel, that's not romantic, but it is sort of, there's something sexual going on there and it's something that's very dark and odd. And same in the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, there are supernatural agencies at work here that are not, there's no sexual uh, connotations there in Ancient Mariner, but it seems dark, it seems to deal with possession. It terrifies the wedding guest when he hears it. He is frightened by that. But he says, um, and he says that supernatural or at least romantic. So unclear exactly what is meant by the word even as he uses it here. Um, it certainly has nothing to do with romance. It may have to do with romance in the sense of the episodes in medieval literature that are dealing with the supernatural, uh, which are called romances, like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. They're episodes in the life that's not an epic in which the whole story from beginning to end is told, but there's an episode in which there are supernatural agencies, and maybe that's what he means, a romance, in that sense, a romantic, and I think that's probably it. <coughs> That's closer to it. And sorry, that was a big digression. Yet so as to transfer from our inward nature a human interest and a semblance of truth sufficient to procure for these shadows of imagination that willing suspension of disbelief for the moment which constitutes poetic faith. Famous phrase, by the way. The willing uh, suspension of disbelief which constitutes poetic faith. You don't have to believe it's real. You just have to be simply so captivated by it that you're not going to question it. Like just imagine this and I'm willing to live in the, the moment that this is happening. You forget, you're, in the, you're watching a film and of course at first you're aware that it's a fiction but once you're watching it you're so captivated that you forget all that. Mr. Wordsworth on the other hand was, was to propose to himself as his object to give the charm of novelty to things of every day and to excite a feeling analogous to the supernatural by awakening the mind's attention to the lethargy of custom and directing it to the loveliness and the wonders of the world before us, an inex inexhaustible treasure, but for which in consequence of the film of familiarity and selfish solicitude we have eyes yet not see, ears that hear not, and hearts that neither feel nor understand. So, there they go on in different paths. One comes out from focusing on, sup focusing on the supernatural, and the other focuses on the natural. And, but the two are, have the same intention, really, just different angles, if you will. And he writes The Ancient Mariner and is preparing others. and Mr. Wordsworth's industry proved so much more successful, and the number of his poems so much greater that my compositions, instead of forming a balance, appeared rather in an interpolation of heterogeneous matter. I mean, there's basic, they're all Wordsworth's poems, pretty much. Mr. Wordsworth added two or three poems written in his own character in the impassioned, lofty, and sustained diction, which is characteristic of his genius. In this form, the lyrical ballads were published and were presented by him as an experiment. 
whether subjects, which from their nature rejected the usual ornaments and extra colloquial style of poems in general, might not be so managed in the language of ordinary life as to produce the pleasurable interest which it is the peculiar business of poetry to impart, to the second edition. He added a preface of considerable length in which, notwithstanding some passages of apparently a contrary import, he was understood to contend for the extension of this style to poetry of all kinds. That was a, one of the implications. All good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling. And to reject as vicious and indefensible all phrases and forms of speech that were not included in what he, unfortunately, I think, adopting an equivocal expression called the language of real life. You can already, I mean, I've added my voice to that, but you can already hear the slightly sarcastic tone here. From this preface, prefix to poems in which it was impossible to deny the presence of original genius, however mistaken its direction might be deemed, arose the long continued controversy. For from the conjunction of perceived power with supposed heresy, there's the charge, I explain the inveteracy and in some instances I grieve to say the acrimonious passions with which the contrary has been conducted by the assailants. Wordsworth has been and Coleridge have been accused of heresy in the poems by Christians, presumably. Had Mr. Wordsworth's poem been the silly, the childish things which they were for a long time described as being, had they been really distinguished from the compositions of other poets merely by meanness of language and inanity of thought, had they indeed contained nothing more than what is found in the parodies and pretended imitations of them, they must have sunk at once a dead weight into the slow of oblivion and have dragged the preface along with them if they had just been trivial, superficial, nonsensical, dealing with talking about children and mothers and if it was just that, what it's, what it's worst critics or what it's probably the majority of the critics. Why are you writing about this? Like this, who cares? But year after year, increased the number of Mr. Wordsworth's admirers. They were found too, not in the lower classes of the reading public, but chiefly among young men of strong sensibility and meditative minds. And their admiration, inflamed perhaps in some degree by opposition, was distinguished by its intensity. I might almost say by its religious fervor. So there's the other aspect of it, and maybe this leads to the charge as well. There is a something akin to a religious fervor for the vision that Wordsworth sets out. Now these facts and the intellectual energy of the author, which was more or less consciously felt, where it was outwardly and even boisterously denied, meeting with sentiments of aversion to his opinions and of alarm at their consequences produced an eddy of criticism which would of itself have borne up the poems by the violence of which it whirled them round and round. So and he's just speaking at the immediate, so it cr created a firestorm of publicity but not because it was trite as some of the readers. There was more, there's substance here. And that holds it and keeps it going. Now, with this is interesting, with many parts of this preface in the sense attributed to them and which the words undoubtedly seem to authorize, I never concurred. I never agreed with what he said what he appeared to say, which there's no other way of saying, I never agreed with him on these things. What does he have in mind? The charge of heresy, probably. I think that's at least one of the possibilities in view. I, don't, I'm, I never concurred. But on the contrary, objected to him as erroneous in principle and as contradictory in appearance, at least, both to other parts of the same preface and to the author's own practice in the greater part of the poems themselves. So it wasn't the poetry, it's his stupid preface and his, his dumb explanation. 
which will make him sound like he's promoting heresy. And the poems don't entail that end. They don't require that end. And yet, he acted and spoke as if he was promoting it and didn't distance himself from it and doubled down on it furthermore. In the, because he brought it out in the preface came out in the poems 1815, which is what caused this whole response. He brought the poems, uh, another collection of poems, and then brought out the preface yet again and doubled down on it and appended it a whole section on the imagination. And Coleridge lost his mind at that point. Mr. Wordsworth, in his recent collection, that is the 1815 poems, has, I find, degraded this prefatory disquisition at the, to the end of his second volume. So it's not a preface anymore. He just throws it in at the end. But he doesn't get rid of it. it it's, it's still there. To be read or not at the reader's choice. But he has not, as far as I can discover, announced any change in his poetic creed. His poetic creed. He used to represent both of us. At all events, considering as a source of a controversy in which I have been honored more than I deserve by the frequent conjunction of my name with his, I think it expedient to declare once for all in what points I coincide with opinions and in what points I differ. But first, <laughs> uh-oh, here comes a digression. But first, before I do that, oh dear, in as few words as possible, explain my views first of a poem and what is poetry in kind and essence. Okay. Sorry. And then he comes up with these wonderful phrase. The office of philosophical disquisition consists in just distinction, a proper distinction. I think, I think that's just Aristotle who says that. While it is the privilege of the philosopher to preserve himself constantly aware that distinction is not division. In order to obtain adequate notions of any truth, we must intellectually separate its distinguishable parts. And this is the technical process of philosophy. But having so done, we must then restore them in our conceptions to the unity in which they actually coexist. And this is the result of philosophy. So it's not enough to pull them apart and say, this is, this is not that, but then you have to put it back together and unify them. So it's not just division, you have to bring them back together. And that will be, then you will have something like a, uh, the act of wisdom. A poem contains the same elements as a prose composition. The difference, therefore, must consist in a different combination of them and in, in consequence of a different object being proposed. So it has the same elements. They're combined differently, and there's a different object. What's the different object? Well, he's going to come to that according to the difference of the object will be the difference of the combination. So it's, it's told the poem is a poem because that is a different uh, intent than a, a prose work because both of them have a beginning and a middle and an end or whatever. And both of them use of schemes and tropes. Both of them have style. It is possible that the object may merely be to facilitate the recollection of any given facts or observations by artificial arrangement and the composition will be a poem merely because it is distinguished from prose by meter or rhyme or by both conjointly. So it could have meter and rhyme and that will announce it as a poem. Either or or both. In this lowest sense, a man might attribute the name of a poem to the well-known enumeration of the days in the several months. 30 days hath September, April, June, and November. That's a poem then if that's the definition of a poem, but he w is not going to agree with that. But that would be a poem because it has meter and it has rhyme. And as a particular pleasure is found in anticipating the recurrence of sounds and qualities, all compositions that have this charm superadded, whatever by their contents, m may be entitled poems, but that's superficial. I mean, it is technically for sure. But a difference of object and content supplies an additional ground of distinction. The immediate purpose may be the communication of truths, either of truth absolute and demonstrable, as in the works of science, or of facts experienced and recorded, as in history. Pleasure, and that of the highest and most permanent kind, may result from the attainment of the end, but it is not itself the immediate end. 
to teach and delight. Teaching is the primary motive. Delight is not there. In other works, the communication of pleasure may be the immediate purpose, and though truth ought to be the ultimate end, yet this will distinguish the character of the author, not the class to which the work belongs. They both have delight and truth, but the one author who's most focused on the truth will be a more excellent author. That's what's going to distinguish it. They may be equally gifted in terms of conveying delight, but it's the, the focus of the author to convey truth will give us a different caliber of author there. We ought to spend a time with the authors that focus on truth, not just those that are able to do a rhyme. Um, do I really want to go down? I don't. You can come back to this. But it's well worth reading. I think it's very interesting myself. Um, but it is slightly um, off topic here because we want to stay fixed on his disagreement with Wordsworth. My own conclusion on the nature of poetry in the strictest use of the word have been in part anticipated in some of the remarks on the fancy and the imagination. Chapter 13. In the early part of this work, what is poetry is so nearly the same question as with what is a poet? Well, it's the repetition in the finite mind. It's the living power and prime agent of all human perception. So it is partly with an ability to think. It's the way that it's connected to that. The answer to the one is involved in the solution of the other, for it is a distinction resulting from the poetic genius itself, which sustains and modifies the images, thoughts, and emotions of the poet's mind. And what is the poet then? The poet, described in ideal perfection, brings the whole soul of man into activity with the subordination of its faculties to each other according to their relative worth and dignity. He diffuses a tone and spirit of unity that blends and, as it were, fuses each into each. And here's his famous phrase, by that synthetic and magical power to which I would exclusively appropriate the name of imagination. It's a synthetic and magical power. So now he's amplifying on his definition of the imagination. This power first put into action by the will and understanding is retained under their irremissive, though gentle and unnoticed, control. Laxus effortur habenis reveals it, quote, itself in the balance or reconcilement of opposite or discordant qualities of sameness with difference, of the general with the concrete, the idea with the image, the individual with the representative, the sense of novelty and freshness with old and familiar objects, a more than unusual state of emotion with more than unusual order. Judgment, ever awake and steady self-possession with enthusiasm and feeling profound or vehement. And while it blends and harmonizes the art of natural and the artificial, still subordinates art to nature, the, ma the manner to the matter, and our admiration of the poet to our sympathy with the poetry. It seems to me if, 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 uh, far too loquacious, and uh, I'm not sure it's entirely helpful, the whole thing. It just seems to be making distinctions that are not as, uh, it's not just that he's off track. I'm not sure that the whole uh, distinctions that he's made here are, are essential to his, his case. At any rate, he then talks about chapter 15, Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis. I'm going to skip over that, and we'll come to chapter 17 and 18. Uh, 17. Okay. So he, he went a little digression to talk about Shakespeare then, and <laughs> not sure why. Now he comes back to Mr. Wordsworth which he was on until he meandered off and talked about Shakespeare. What are the tenets peculiar to them? Rustic life, and he's going to go back to the things that he identified early on uh, as things on which he disagreed. He said he didn't, dis he didn't agree that all poetry is this. And then he effectively announces his um, disagreement. The best parts of language are the product of philosophers, not of clowns or shepherds. <laughs> 
he said that the best parts of language come from like rustics and and these sorts of people and Kohler said that's never been true it isn't true it never will be true poetry is essentially ideal and generic the language of Milton is as much the language of real life yea incomparably more so than that of the cottager so it's the tendentious the language of real life oh so Milton because he doesn't talk like one of your rustics in your poetry doesn't speak real life well what do we mean by real real then has an idealized sense ideal and generic Milton sp is speaking of universal truths he's talking about God that's real real does not mean that the way people usually talk here's my reality or get real or right like this is the way I see things that's not real that's not reality that you're demonstrating your short-sighted thoughtless way of in, engaging with the world but that doesn't what we that's not what we mean by real in general and good poetry will deal with the truth with the truth of things which is going to see more than the material physical world and in fact it's going to appeal to the very supernatural world that Wordsworth's poetry does but which the your farmer dealing with his sheep never thinks about as far then as Mr. Wordsworth in his preface contended and most ably contended for a reformation in our poetic diction as far as he evinced the truth of passion and the dramatic propriety of those figures and metaphors in the original poets which stripped of their justifying reasons and converted into mere artifices of connection or ornament constitute the characteristic falsity in the poetic style of the moderns and as far as he has with equal acuteness and clearness pointed out the process by which this change was effected and the resemblances between that state into which the reader's mind is thrown by the pleasurable confusion of thought from an unaccustomed train of words and images and that state which is induced by the natural language of impassioned feeling he undertook a useful task so <laughs> this is his main clause by the way he undertook a useful task but all this stuff was before the subclause subclause comes out insofar as da, 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 da. but all he's saying he undertook a useful task and here's the limitations on it complex sentence and deserves all praise both for the attempt and the execution the provocations to this remonstrance in behalf of truth and nature were still of perpetual recurrence before and after the publication of this preface so the poetry is great and it does do it does reform our diction it is effective in awakening people's sensibilities it's very good the poetry is I have nothing to uh, blame him for in this respect and I cannot likewise but add that the comparison of such poems of merit as have been given to the public within the last 10 or 12 years with the majority of those produced previously to the appearance of that preface leave no doubt in my mind that Mr. Wordsworth is fully justified in believing his efforts to have been by no means ineffectual he has effected a reformation of our poetic diction no doubt not even so praising him not only in the verses of those who have profess their admiration of his genius but even of those who have distinguished themselves by hostility hostility to his theory and de depreciation of his writings are the impressions of his principles plainly visible it is possible that these principles with these others may have been blended which are not equally evident and some which are unsteady and subvertible from the narrowness or imperfection of their basis but it is more than possible that these errors of defect or exaggeration by kindling and feeding the controversy may have concluded not only to the wider propagation of the accompanying truth but that by their frequent presentation to the mind in an excited state they may have won for them a more permanent and practical result so it may be that actually people being confused by what he said and inflamed by it he may have actually had a bigger effect by the confusion 
and the, the effect may be even better from that. And this is, and now he makes a very interesting comment. A man will borrow a part from his opponent the more easily if he feels himself justified in continuing to reject a part. I can keep on saying this. And even though it comes from you, because I know in my own mind I don't agree with that, so I can just keep on presenting it. And so the true things about what Wordsworth said are having a lasting impression even in his opponent's minds. Because they borrowed from him. They've borrowed something. They've been transformed by what they read in Wordsworth, even though they disagree with him. While there remain important points in which he can feel himself in the right, in which he finds firm footing for continued resistance, he will gradually adopt those opinions which were the least remote from his own convictions as not less congruous with his own theory than that which he reprobates. Okay. My own differences from certain supposed parts of Mr. Wordsworth's theory ground themselves on the assumption that his words had been rightly interpreted as purporting that the proper diction for poetry in general consists altogether in a language taken with, two, with due exceptions from the mouths of men in real life, a language which actually constitutes the natural conversation of men under the influence of natural feelings. Here's where I disagree. What's my objection? First, that in any sense, this rule is applicable only to certain classes of poetry. Secondly, that even to these classes, it's not applicable. <laughs> Except in such a sense as hath never by anyone, as far as I know or have read, been denied or doubted. So what's the point in saying it? Nobody's ever denied this, so why would you assert it as if you had an opponent here? And lastly, that as far as, and in that degree in which it is practical, it is yet as a rule useless, if not injurious, and therefore either need not or ought not to be practiced. <laughs> so it's just nonsense. The poet informs his reader that he had generally chosen low and rustic life, but not as low and rustic. He chose this but not because it was low and rustic, but he chose that life. Why? In order to repeat that pleasure of doubtful moral effect, which persons of elevated rank and of superior refinement oftentimes derives from a happy imitation of the rude, unpolished manners and discourse of their inferiors. So they can imitate the, the language that they hear on the streets, can start talking like the uneducated speaking colloquialisms, and they get some pleasure from that. For the pleasure so derived may be traced to three exciting causes. The first is the naturalness, in fact, of the things represented. The second is the apparent naturalness of the representation as raised and qualified by an imperceptible infusion of the author's own knowledge and talent, which infusion does indeed constitute it in an imitation as distinguished from a mere copy. So the imitation, the mimesis again, so it's not just copying what they say, but it's something in that. So there is something poetic in when, when Wordsworth does this. The third cause may be found in the reader's conscious feeling of his superiority, awakened <coughs> me, by the contrast presented to him, even as for the same purpose the kings and great barons of yore retain sometimes actual clowns and fools. We may put this in just because it makes us feel superior. So I have a court fool, a court jester, a clown around my court. Makes. But he says, these were not Wordsworth's objects. He chose low and rustic life, quote, because in that condition the essential passions of the heart find a better soil, uh, and he's going to do the whole long quote here. All these things, like the long, it's a long direct quotation from Wordsworth here. And then he's going to digress. And then he will say the virtues of Wordsworth's poems, his best poems, the most interesting them. He sees that independence which raises a man above certitude. That's what he values in the rustics. They actually think like free men. 
there's something of dignity in the individuals. These are people who, are, although they are in common life, are good moral characters. but not above the necessity and frugal simplicity of domestic life. And the accompanying unambitious but solid and religious education, which has rendered few books familiar but the Bible and the liturgy or the hymn book. So this is the feelings and manners of the shepherd farmers in the vales of Cumberland and Westmoreland. So when he gives them their language, he's saying, that the reason we admire them is not because it's low and rustic, but exactly the opposite, because it's not low and rustic, it is marked by a freedom, an inner freedom, which comes from virtuous character, one, and uh, an acquaintance with the narrative of scripture, which makes them speak not like low-born people at all. It makes them sound like born-again, spirit-filled individuals. There is where it is. It's not because it's low and rustic. That's incidental. Because in some people, they don't read at all, but they do read the Bible and they do hear the liturgy and the hymn book. That's what they get. That's their whole reading. They don't read, uh, but they have that and that changes them. And that's what makes his rustics sound so good it's not because they're low uh, and they're they're acquainted with the forms of nature that's not it it's not that it's because they have a different influence in this latter cause that is the bible liturgy in the hymn book indeed which is so far accidental that it is the blessing of particular countries and a particular age not the product of particular places or employments so this is not because they're rustics or farmers Otherwise, he could talk about farmers in a country where they've never read the Bible and so forth, but nobody in, in the bush in South America talks like Wordsworth's rustics because they have not had the Bible presented to them. So it's not the place in nature. It's not their employment. They're farmers. It is that they've had the influence of better things than that. That's what makes it. And then it is an excellent remark of Dr. Henry Moore's that, quote, a man of confined education, but of good parts, so a good person, by constantly reading of the Bible will naturally form a more winning and commanding rhetoric than those that are learned. The intermixture of tongues and of artificial phrases debasing their style. You're better off not being hyper-educated. If you only read the Bible, and you read it regularly, it will change your whole sentiments and character more than a more formalized, sophisticated education. It's pretty clear this is a Christian critique, I think, right? I don't see how you read it otherwise. It is moreover to be considered that to the formation of healthy feelings and a reflecting mind, negations involve impediments not less formidable than sophistication and vicious intermixture. I am convinced that for the human soul to prosper in rustic life, a certain vantage ground is prerequisite. For the human soul in rustic life, you have to be on a certain vantage ground. You have to be a little bit lifted up. You have to be up on a hill. You have to just be on the flat ground. You have to be lifted up a little bit. It is not every man that is likely to be improved by a country life or by country labors. You don't get more virtuous by shoveling and mucking out the pens of the pigs. That doesn't make you a better man. Education or, or original sensibility or both must pre-exist if the changes, forms, and incidents of nature are to prove a sufficient stimulant. And where these are not sufficient, the mind contracts and hardens by want of stimulants, and the man becomes selfish, sensual, gross, and hard-hearted. So it's not being a rustic. That's a red herring. Let the management of the poor laws in Liverpool, Manchester, or Bristol be compared with the ordinary dispensation of the poor rates in agricultural villages where the farmers are the overseers and guardians of the poor. So compare what happens in those big cities where people are treated abominably to these areas where actually people care about those who look after them. So he's saying 
there is a difference there and it's not just being a farmer it's where there is a care and compassion shown that will change the people under their care if my own experience have not been particularly un had, have not been particularly unfortunate as well as that of the many respectable country clergymen with whom I've conversed on the subject, the res result would engender more than skepticism concerning the desirable influences of low and rustic life in and for itself. Anybody who's been around in the countryside knows that they're not better people by being in the country. Just from that, it's just like nonsense. Whatever may be concluded on the other side from the stronger local attachments and the enterprising spirit of the Swiss, other mountaineers applies to a particular mode of pastoral life under forms of property that permit and beget manners truly republican, not to rustic life in general or to the absence of artificial culturation. So now he's going to compare the English. The, the Swiss might be better because they have a republican government which comes out of Geneva and Mr. Calvin, and they have a certain view of life, and they can still be farmers. Yes, farmers, but the farmers are not the key feature here. It is other things that have been conveyed. The whole ethos of that area will create a different thing, not from looking after pigs. On the contrary, the, the mountaineers whose manners have been so often eulogized are in better, in general, better educated and greater readers than men of equal rank elsewhere. Again, Calvin's Geneva, the Swiss influenced by this. But where this is not the case is among the peasantry of North Wales, the ancient mountains with all their terror and all their glories are pictures to the blind and music to the deaf. It doesn't change them. Just having more beautiful nature does nothing to improve people. I mean, I think it's a common sense argument, but he's making... He, I should not have entered in so much into detail upon this passage. But here seems to be the point to which all the lines of difference converge as to their source and center. I mean, as far as, and in whatever respect, my poetic creed does differ from the doctrines promulgated in this preface. I adopt with full faith the principle of Aristotle that poetry, as poetry, is essentially ideal, that it avoids and excludes, excludes all accident that its apparent individualities of rank, character, or occupation must, must be representative of a class, and that the persons of poetry must be clothed with generic attributes, with the common attributes of the class, not with such as one, one gifted individual might possibly possess. So don't talk to me about Superman farmer. Talk about your normal farmer, the farmers that you meet. Don't talk about this idealized farmer that nobody's ever met. But such as from his situation, it is most probable beforehand that he would possess. If my premises are right and my deductions, deductions are legitimate, it follows that there can be no poetic medium between the swains of Theocritus and those of an imaginary golden age. And so then he gets again into this, a specific poem, specific poems. and applies his comments to them. In The Idiot Boy, indeed, the mother's character is not so much the real and native product of, quote, a situation where the essential passions of the heart find a better soil in which they can attain their maturity and speak a plainer and more emphatic language, as it is an impersonation of an instinct abandoned by judgment. She's mad. It's not because she's a better person. Hence, the two following charges seem to me not wholly groundless. At least they are the only plausible objections which I've heard to that, that fine poem. The one is that the author has not in the poem itself taken sufficient care to preclude from the reader's fancy the disgusting images of ordinary morbid idiocy, which yet it was by no means his intention to represent. He, he was even by the burr, 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 the boy, the idiot boy, this is him speaking. Uh, uncounteracted by any preceding description of the boy's beauty assisted in recalling them and the other is that the idiocy of the boy is so evenly balanced by the folly of the mother as to present to the general reader a rather laughable burlesque on the blindness of anile dotage than an analytic display of maternal affection in the ordinary workings but note that he is 
engaging specifically with the poem. So then let me come here to a theory or a doubt. If then I am compelled to doubt the theory and the language purified that because such men hourly communicate with the best objects from which the best part of language is originally derived and because from their rank in society in the sameness and narrow circle of their intercourse being less under the action of social vanity they convey their feelings and notions in simple and unelaborated expressions so now i mean by this point he start it's i think it starts being cruel because he's just words what words was said is so plainly ridiculous and and he's just going to destroy the arguments um, it's all because of the blessed peasant, the noble savage in front of us is effectively the noble savage argument. These are noble savages in our presence, and they are, they're aware of this because they're noble, and they're not. And they're noble because they're not moved by the vanity, because they are only ever presented, uh, surrounded by the beautiful nature, etc. And to this I reply that a rustic's language purified from any provincialism and grossness, and so far reconstructed as to be made consistent with the rules of grammar which are in essence no other than the laws of universal logic applied to psychological materials, will not differ from the language of any other men of common sense. There's nothing special about the language of the noble savage. However learned or refined he may be, except as far as the notions which the rustic has to convey are fewer and more indiscriminate. Because what does he see? He has a very... Um, rudimentary palette of experiences. You go out, you milk the cows, you muck the, out the pens, you do, you do the same thing every day. Are you dealing with complex, rich, uh, your life might be rich in one sense, but in terms of different types of things, it's pretty mundane. Um, this will be still clear if we add the consideration, equally important though less obvious, that the rustic from the most imperfect, more imperfect development of his faculties and from the lower state of their cultivation aims almost solely to convey insulated facts, either those of his scanty experience or his traditional belief, while the educated man chiefly seeks to discover and express those connections of things or those relative bearings of fact to fact from which some more, more or less general law is deducible, for facts are valuable to a wise man chiefly as they lead to the discovery of the indwelling law, which is the true being of things, etc. And he cannot agree with the assertion that the rustic hourly communicates the best part of language is formed from it. Uh, let me come. Now here's Mr. Wordsworth's. Mr. Coleridge's contention. It's not everything Wordsworth says. It's this. The best part of human language, properly so-called, is derived from reflection on the acts of the mind itself. It's not from association with what Wordsworth calls nature. It's from a reflection on the nature of humanity and the way it plays out and the way we think about it. That's where the best part of human language and it is formed by a voluntary appropriation of fixed symbols to internal acts, to processes and the results of imagination, the greater part of which have no place in the consciousness of uneducated man. Though in civilized society by imitation and passive remembrance of what they hear from their religious instructors and other superiors, the most uneducated share in the harvest which they neither sowed nor reaped. So it's not that it's kept in the rank of the social, uh, or not the social, the intellectual elite that study these things, who spend their life studying philosophy. Study by this, the, by they're studying wisdom, they're seeking to be wise, they're cultivating themselves in this way. That's where the best part of human language comes from. It comes from philosophy. But it can be passed on to others. And how will it be passed on? Well, he comes with this, if the history of the phrases in hourly currency among our peasants were traced, a person not previously aware of the fact 
would be surprised at finding so large a number which three or four centuries ago were the exclusive property of the universities and the schools and at the commencement of the Reformation had been transferred, transferred from the school to the pulpit and thus passed into common life. So if the commoners speak better, it's because of biblical dissemination from the pulpit and it's changed. The people, the common people, have been transformed by the word, word of God and by the categories that were once only talked about in the universities, now it's passed on. The extreme difficulty, and, and here comes another way of illustrating in reverse. So he does it historically. Look at what, how, co how commoners speak four centuries ago. Look at how they speak now. They are vastly more educated, even though they're not necessarily in schools. Remember, there's no compulsory education when Wordsworth or when Coleridge writes this yet. But here's another way of illustrating the extreme difficulty and often the impossibility of finding words for the simplest moral and intellectual processes of language of uncivilized tribes has proved perhaps the weightiest obstacle to the progress of our most zealous and adroit missionaries. We have no correspondence in, our, in their language for, for concepts that we have in ours. They just don't have words. It says this in scripture. How do I translate this into this language? They don't have the word. It doesn't exist. The concept doesn't exist. How do you communicate that then? Huge obstacle to all translation. If, you, if it doesn't exist already in that language, you have to invent a word or use a word that they don't know yet and then acquaint them with the meaning of what that word is and then acquaint them with the importance of that word before they're willing to adopt it then. But it's not a native word to the language. And yet, these tribes are surrounded by the, the same nature as our peasants are, but in more impressive forms. And they are moreover obliged to particularize many more of them. So, and he's now talking about Africa, for instance. Like they have vast, beautiful, natural landscapes. And they are moreover obliged to particularize more than, why them? Because there's how many infinite varieties of birds and trees and they don't just have oaks and maples and whatever and apples. They have a hundred varieties of bananas and mangoes and other fruits that we've never tasted and so forth. They've, they particularize those things, but does that lead them to better character? No, not on its own. When therefore Mr. Wordsworth adds, accordingly such a language, meaning as before the language of rustic life, purified from provincialism, arising out of repeated experience and regular feelings, is more permanent, a far more philosophical language than that which is frequently substituted for it by poets who think they can, are conferring honor upon themselves and their art in proportion as they indulge in arbitrary and capricious habits of expression. It may be answered that the language which he has in view can be attributed to rustics with no greater right than the style of Hooker or Bacon or Tom Brown or Sir Roger Lestrange. Doubtless, if what is peculiar to each were omitted in each, the result must needs be the same. So if we take out everything that's different, then of course it's the same. Yep, because there's nothing left that's different, yes. Further, that the poet who uses an illogical diction or a style fitted to excite only the low, like now he's just destroying him logically, <laughs> it's pounding. Anyway, um, I, th I think that section is particularly strong and, and strong in destroying the claim that it's the nature that results in the improved character. He, he presents a whole variety of it, but one of them why it can't be the nature is because in other countries the nature is even superior and the people aren't superior for, by dint of being associated with it. There's, they don't have this. They commit savage acts sometimes. They certainly don't have any awareness of higher truths. They don't have a sense of the importance of Republican government, which he said that the Swiss have, where the Swiss get it from, because they don't want to be ruled by a king, because of a natural sense of sovereignty. They're going to associate themselves for limited government, etc. Why? Where did they get that from? Well, they got it from scripture. The farmers might be doing it, but they've, they've, it's directly from having been influenced by, by scriptural truths. The 
peasants, uh, farmers in other countries are not the same, even though they're both peasant farmers. So it's nothing to do with being a f peasant farmer. It has everything to do with something else. Doesn't mean his poetry isn't powerful, but he, the reason he gives for it is not correct. Can't be correct. I think he destroys him there, actually. Uh, I'll skip over the line. But now, but you know, nor is it in a state of excitement. So now he's every little phrase he he, he goes he he he, it, he doesn't agree with the the general thrust. He he disagrees with every word. <laughs> he goes after every phrase in the in the preface now, and I I, I just think it's funny, um, and I, and and I think it's self evidently correct. It that Wordsworth's preface is awful, and I think as I say Wordsworth was not they were not on good terms before. And this is <laughs> like this the end of it. But let me go to section. It's only here where he gets the defects of Wordsworth's poetry. And also his greatest features. I'll skip over the defects. He talks about the inconstancy of the style. Um, he talks about uh, various small things, but then he comes to the strengths, and this is the last. Second defect, uncouth new coin words. These are small things. But what are the great? The third, the fourth class, the fifth and last. So these are the defects. He lists five, and they're pretty trivial, small. So he disagrees with the preface and destroys the preface. As for the poetry, it has certain defects. Let me list those. Five different categories of it. But now let's get on to the um, strengths. Though the instances of this defect in Mr. Wordsworth's poems are so few that for themselves, it would have been scarcely just to attract the reader's attention toward them. Yet I have dwelt on it and perhaps the more for this very reason. For being so very few, they cannot sensibly detract from the reputation of an author who is even characterized by the number of profound truths in his writings, which will stand the severest analysis. And yet few as they are, they are exactly those which passages which his blind admirers would be most likely and best able to imitate. So his, his, the people that admire him uh, actually imitate the worst features of his poetry. And they can't touch a glove on him in the best features. Well, because what are those? But Wordsworth, where he is indeed Wordsworth, may be mimicked by copyists. He may be plundered by plagiarists, but he cannot be imitated, except by those who are not born to be imitators. For without his depth of feeling and his imaginative power, his sense would want its vital warmth and peculiarity. And without this strong sense, his mysticism would become sickly, mere fog and dimness. So he's already coming to now. We're rounding out. And now let me talk about the greatness of Wordsworth. First excellence. I mean, he's not brief. Austere purity of language, both grammatically and logically. In short, a perfect appropriateness of the words to the meaning. Of, high, of how high value I deem this and how particularly estimable I hold the example at the present day has already been stated. And in 
part two, the reasons on which I ground both the moral and intellectual importance of habituating ourselves to a strict accuracy of expression. So he is clear and pure in logic and grammar in his expression. Second, a correspondent weight and sanity of the thoughts and sentiments. One, not from books, but from the poet's own meditative observation. So he's not just repeating, as Aristotle says, as, someone, as Milton says, he sees what, he's influenced by these books, but he sees with his own eyes and he speaks with his own voice and his judgment is profound. And he gets it right. He makes us feel what he feels and, and makes us love what he loves. He is, they are fresh and have the dew upon them. Isn't that great? His muse, at least when in her strength of wing and when she hovers aloft in her proper element, makes audible a linked lay of truth, of truth profound, a sweet continuous lay, not learnt, but native, her own natural notes. And now he's going to cite passages which illustrate this. Have a look at them yourself. They're terrific. I'm, I'm just going to run out of time if I look through them. And both in respect of this and of the former excellence, Mr. Wordsworth strikingly resembles Samuel Daniel, one of the golden writers of our, old, our own golden Elizabethan age, now most causelessly neglected. To the, the ode on the intimations of immortality from recollections of early childhood, the poet might have prefixed the lines which Dante addresses to one of his own canzoni. But the ode most was intended for such readers only as have been accustomed to watch the flux and reflux of their inmost nature, to venture at times into the twilight realms of consciousness, etc. Now third, and here he soars far above Daniel, the sinewy strength and originality of single lines and paragraphs, the frequent curiosa felicitas of his diction, of which I need not here give specimens, having anticipated them in the in a preceding page. This beauty and as eminently characteristic and as eminently characteristic of Wordsworth's poetry, his rudest assailants have felt themselves compelled to acknowledge and admire. There are certain lines that are so powerful that even his critics have to say that's just so well put. Fourth, the perfect truth of nature in his images and descriptions are as taken immediately from nature which they're not. He's just argued that they're not taken immediately, but he at attaches them so strongly to nature that it convicts us that it's actually in the nature. It's in the nature, even though it isn't. He's just argued it isn't. It's come from the pulpit, whatever, but now he's directly attributed from that. But this is part of the power, the perfect truth of nature in his images and descriptions as taken immediately from nature and proving a long and genial intimacy with the very spirit which gives the physiognomic expression to all the works of nature, like a green field reflected in a calm and perfectly transparent lake. The image is distinguished from the reality only by its greater softness and luster. Like the moisture or the polish on a pebble, genius neither distorts nor false colors its objects, but on the contrary brings out many a vein and many a tint which escape the eye of common observation, thus raising to the rank of gems what had been often kicked away by the hurrying foot of the traveler on the dusty high road of custom. Isn't that brilliant? Now he has, uh, for all of his verbal, like just effusion, at times the phrase is just so fantastic. Now let me refer to this passage in skating. Fantastic, fantastic, but I'm not going to do it. Fifth, a meditative pathos, a union of deep and subtle thought with sensibility, a sympathy with man as man, the sympathy indeed of a contemplator rather than a fellow sufferer or co-mate, spectator, how particeps, but of a contemplator from whose view no difference of rank conceals the sameness of nature. He's a better man than us, but he talks like he's just one of us. He doesn't lord it over us. He talks like a man talking to men. Yes, there's nothing arrogant about Mr. Wordsworth, and yet he is superior to us. 
No one else would have been able to, to write what he writes. No injuries of wind or weather or toil or even of ignorance wholly disguise the human face divine. The superscription and the image of the Creator still remain legible to him under the dark lines with which guilt or calamity had canceled or cross-barred it. So what does he see? He sees God and his hand in all things, which most people can't see. And he shows us. He sees it and he shows us because he himself sees it. Here the man and the poet lose and find themselves in each other. The one as glorified, the latter as substantiated. In this mild and philosophic pathos, Wordsworth appears to me without a compeer. There is no, he has no equal. There is no poet before him or after him that is Wordsworth. Wordsworth is the poet on this. And lastly, and preeminently, I challenge for this poet the gift of imagination in the highest and strictest sense of the word. So it, what, he, he could not be more categoric in destroying his own preface and what he said, why it is. It's all wrong. How can it be all wrong when everything he, he has, it, everything about his poetry is right, and yet his explanation is so appallingly wrong? Anyway, he has the gift of imagination in the highest and strictest sense of the word. In the play of fancy, Wordsworth to my feelings, is not always graceful and sometimes recondite, sort of obscure. Like, what? What are you talking? But the likeness is occasionally too strange or the demands too pecu peculiar a point of view or in such as appears the creature of predetermined research rather than spontaneous presentation. Indeed, his fancy seldom displays itself as mere and unmodified fancy. But in imaginative power, he stands nearest of all modern writers to Shakespeare and Milton. and yet in a kind perfectly unborrowed and his own. To employ his own words, which are at once an instance and an illustration, he does indeed to all things and to all objects add the gleam, the light that never was on sea or land, the consecration and the poet's dream. And now he goes on to illustrate this in a few other passages. Right? The th o joy that our embers is something that doth live. The nature that your remembers what was so fugitive, that's the immortality ode, right? And it would, since it would be unfair to conclude with an extract, which, though highly characteristic, must yet from the nature of the thoughts and the object be interesting or perhaps intelligible, but to but a limited number of readers, I will add from the poet's last published work. So he's still reading Wordsworth. He still admires him. They don't talk but he still reveres him as a poet. Uh, so much for the detractors of Wordsworth's merits. Anyway, um, I think I'm close to that. Comments or questions? He, so he really concludes, and he says that Wordsworth brings us in everyday life to um, a reverence for God in the presence of nature the same way we normally feel when we walk into a church. He does this and encourages us to do this when we look at the world at all times. And not because Wordsworth is encouraging us towards pantheism, but because he's... But note that Wordsworth's own words push us in that direction. So that's the problem. Wordsworth's encouraging us to be pantheists according to his preface. He's encouraging us to be heretics, according to his preface, but that's not what his poetry does, actually. It doesn't need to do that, however, right? So my comment on this is then, why do the critics not recognize Coleridge's critique of Wordsworth for what it is? It's as if he didn't write the critique, and it's, uh, to me it's obviously a Christian critique, I think. That's the basis of the critique, the illustrations even, of com uh, the comparisons. He, he's talking about the effects of a biblical understanding of the world, which Wordsworth himself, he says, has, and the poems demonstrate. But his explanation for that is so bad 
that you would think he's trying to promote pantheism and all of his critics are calling him a heretic for it and I don't agree with their explanation or, or their critique of Wordsworth, but if you listen to Wordsworth, then they're right. He is a heretic. Why would he say this? Because that's what he's being charged with. It's hard to defend Mr. Wordsworth as a non-heretic if his own words seem to suggest that he is. But Mr. Coleridge's defense of Wordsworth is a very different sort of thing. He's, in, he's um, defending the goodness of Word's poetry in spite of the man, which is a very, and I, I, I don't read that in the, in the critics. They're not picking that up. It's in spite of Wordsworth that he's good, not because of what he says, but the critics are in agreement with Wordsworth in his, so that's the, uh, the greater irony. And furthermore, to add to salt, rub salt into the wound, they say that Coleridge is the chief representative of the Romantics in their definition of the imagination, even while <laughs> I thought Wordsworth was. He, I mean, he's, and, and Coleridge's critique of the imagination is a Christian one. The critics aren't Christians and they're not grasping the Christian critique. That's what I found when I looked at this. I don't see how else you read it. There's certain in the second half when he, there's certainly, I mean, there's a little bit of Kant leading up to it, right? He talks about Immanuel Kant. Okay. After that, he's gone. He's, he was just a face. So, and he dismisses him. I can't believe he didn't mean more by this than he, he did, but he sounds like that's all he meant. Okay. He seemed to be on to something here, but he, claim, he plainly doesn't see, see the light. So let's move on to the next. That seems to me to, so I wonder whether the critics can read. Yes. Uh, I was also thinking regarding the charge that he is a constant. According to constant philosophy, you can't know God in any definite sense other than like what he calls an ideal of reason. Right. He's plainly contradicting Kant. Contradicting that He's told, of course, explicitly. Yeah. Hmm? There's, there's no way of, of putting the two in the same camp. I, I agree. I argued that in print and um, defended it in my thesis. And I 